Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhad. In this session, we would look at interim reporting. This topic is covered in advanced accounting and surely covered on the CPA exam. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. YouTube is where I house over 1,500 plus accounting, audit, and tax lectures. Please like my lectures if you like them, share them, put them in playlists. If you're benefiting from them, it means other people might benefit as well. This is my Instagram account. This is my Facebook account. I do have a few premium recording on Gumroad and I do have a website. You want to make sure you visit my website because on my website, I always have offers, especially for CPA and accounting students. Right now, Becker is running a limited time offer with unlimited access to the best CPA course out there, Becker. This is unusual because usually Becker never had an unlimited offer before. I strongly suggest if you're studying for your CPA, that's the best course you can have. Also, if you are an accounting student, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt to sign up for it because it has unlimited access. You could use the course to supplement your college studies. So let's talk about, about interim reporting. The first thing is we talk about what's the big idea. The big idea about interim reporting is something called the periodicity principle. And what is that periodicity principle? You should have learned about that principle in Financial Accounting 101. And basically the periodicity principle state that the life of the company is broken down into artificial period. So for example, let me just, let's do it quarterly. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So the life of the company is broken into four periods. Usually, not usually, publicly traded companies, they have to prepare their statements, financial statements on a quarterly basis. This quarterly basis, which is not a complete year, this partial year is called, called interim, interim reporting. So it's, it's, it's a reporting period that's less than a year. So fi interim financial statements are presented to provide information about the financial status and progress for time period for less, less than a year. Because once we have a full year, then we issue our annual report, okay? The normal time period is a quarter of a year. Uh, it's prepared for the most recent interim period as well as on a cumulative basis. So when you get to Q2, you would report Q2 plus Q1 and Q2. So the numbers would include both. And you will uh, prepare financial statements such as income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, statements of shareholders equity, basically statements that you would prepare on an annual basis, but they are on a quarterly basis. Now, if you're a publicly traded company, the SEC requires public, company, public companies to file their 10Q. Q is for a quarter. Don't confuse 10Q with 10K, which is the annual. annual. Those statements, the 10Qs are reviewed. The 10 Qs are reviewed. It means they, the auditor or the preparers of the financial statements, well, the auditors, they perform inquiries, analytical procedures, financial ratios. The point is they are not audited. They are not audited. Inquiries, not inquired. Inquiries. You perform inquiries. Okay. What is the problem with interim reporting? Um, well, it's not a complete year. And for some businesses, uh, the, the nature of the business could be seasonal. So what does it mean seasonal? Let's look at a ski business. In a ski business, if you look at the revenues, uh, the revenues would look like uh, would look like this if it's on a time, if it's on a yearly time frame. For example, if this is the year, if this is January till December, well, it's gonna look it's gonna look high in January. Then it's gonna start to go down. It's gonna go. No. This is a spike here, an unnecessary spike. So the revenues will be high, then it's gonna, you know, close to zero. Then by the end of the year, it will go up again because it's the ski season. So notice it's seasonal. So if you break down their company into quarters, well, in some quarters, you're gonna have a lot of revenues and in quarters, not a lot of revenues. And the same thing with expenses. So that's one of the problem. So which accounting method we should use? How should you account for this, for the short period? Well, there's two, basically two methods two or, or two kind of uh, uh, two theories but there are two methods okay uh, one one method says that accountant should hold each interim period as a standalone discrete view this is called the discrete view well what does that mean it's mean the quarter is independent so what you do at the end of the quarter you adjust for revenues for expenses as if it's the end of the year although it's the end of the quarter okay the other method is the interim period is essentially an integral part of the annual report. So this period is only a part of the annual report. So you, when you are performing, when you are preparing your financial statements, you should take and everything into consideration for the whole year. For example, you would allocate your expenses. For example, if you paid 
your advertising expense, you would say, well, this ad advertising expense for the whole year, therefore I would allocate it. The depreciation is for the whole year, so on and so forth. Now in practice, there is some vagueness in this area or some vagueness in how, which method you can use because for some expenses you can use the int integral part and some you could use the standalone. So just bear, bear in mind that, that there is some vagueness in this issue. Now the board, Conclude. That's that's the conclude. That's the that's basically the, uh, uh, the the decision that each period should be viewed as an integral part. That sometimes for some items you might you might have to use a standalone. Okay, so financial statements for each period should be based on the accounting practices used for the whole year. Of course, you cannot use different accounting practices, different accounting method. You have to use the same method. For example, for revenues. If you're using the percentage of completion method, you have to use the percentage of completion method for the quarter as well as as well as the for the whole year. So you cannot switch method. And any cost associated with revenue should be treated the same for the interim period. For example, how you would account for labor, material, overhead, you should be using the same method as far as revenue and any related expenses associated with that revenue, directly associated. Uh, inventory. Well, there are acceptable alternative methods for inventory. For example, cost of goods sold can be estimated using the gross profit percentage. So you don't have to compute, uh, you don't have to count your uh, inventory by ed by the end of the quarter. You could use the gross profit method. If you don't know what the gross profit method e is, it's just a way to estimate ending inventory in order to determine cost of goods sold. Now, although we use the gross profit for the quarterly, you would have to disclose, you know, what did you do and reconcile this method for the end of the year. Liquidated LIFO base should be charged at replacement cost if expected to be replaced by the end of the year. So simply put, if you had a, if you have a LIFO liquidation, don't don't account for LIFO liquidation and, and, unless you are not replacing. But if you are going to be replacing LIFO liquidation so it's not going to appear, then there is no need to account for life if, if LIFO liquidation that occur. So you, you, it's useless work. If you're going to do it during the quarter, by the end of the year, you replace your LIFO, your, you replace your inventory, then don't do it. Now you might be saying, what is LIFO liquidation? What is that? Well, if you don't know what LIFO liquidation is, go to my intermediate accounting chapter nine intermediate accounting chapter nine we'll talk about life of liquidation just in case you are not, you're not familiar with inventory or the gross profit method okay inventory loss from market decline expected to be recovered before the end of the year should not be recognized same concept at life at life at, for life of liquidation remember we have to re report inventory at lower of cost or net realizable value net realizable value this used to be lcm lower of cost or market now we say lower of cost or net realizable value but if you think your inventory is going to recover by the end of the year, so let's assume this is second, third, and fourth quarter, you experience decline in your inventory here. Don't book, the, don't book it if you think by the fourth quarter it's going to recover. Because it's it's useless work. You're going to write it down, then, then if it's going to be written up, why did you write it down if it's going to be written up? Now, if it's going to be down till the end of the quarter, till the end of the year, then you would write it down. But don't do it. Basically, in a sense, you will do the work, then you reverse it. Standard cost for determining inventory should be based on the procedure used for the same year. So whatever standard cost you are using, you would use the same cost. What about costs other than product costs, such as period costs, expenses uh, um, for the headquarter, for the payroll, for HR? Okay, you charge to income as incurred based on estimated time expired. For example, if there's a time expired associated with that expense or benefit received, is it benefiting this period? That period cost you expense it or activity associated? Is it when we perform an activity? Is it being? Is it being? Uh, is it being? Uh, is it being expensed? Uh, time expired, think about depreciation. For example, if you're doing straight line, you just divide the straight line by four, okay? Now, if not readily identified with an activity or a benefit, it should be recognized when incurred. So you cannot identify it with an activity, you cannot identify it with a certain benefit, um, then, and you cannot do a time expired. You cannot allocate it over a, a period of time reasonably. So what you do is when you, when you, when you incur that expense, you would just charge it to expense. You should not do arbitrary assignments. Okay. So basically take the expense and spread it out annually. First, see if you can allocate it to something, activity, time period, benefits. Also gains and losses that would not be deferred at the end of the year should not be deferred at the interim period. So if you have any, any gain or losses and you know those gain and losses will not be deferred by the end of the year, then you would, you would not defer them. You would count them during the quarter. Okay. Now there are other issues that kind of 
kind of uh, you have more than one option for example advertising and similar costs think about advertising when you advertise when you spend money let's just look at it from a quarterly perspective one two three four let's assume you spend some money here in the second quarter on advertising well you spent you know three hundred thousand dollars well, this $300,000, is it only benefiting this quarter or is it benefiting the third, the fourth, and maybe into the following year? You really don't know because no one knows the benefit of advertising, right? You don't know the future benefit of it, okay? So the general guidelines are that companies should defer interim period costs such as advertising if it benefit extended, extended period beyond that period. Now, how would you know? Okay, how, you, you really don't know. Sometimes you just have to make a decision. I don't think it's going to benefit or I think it's benefit. Okay, if you don't think it's going to benefit, you will expense them. Okay, so there's there's a vagueness in this area. So just want to make sure you are aware of this. Okay, for example, some companies such as Nabisco charge advertising as a percentage of sales. Then they will adjust it at year end. Okay, so so what they say is the more we sell, the more the more we expense in advertising because they are related to each other. General Food and Kellogg they expense the cost as they incur. As soon as they incur them, they just expense it. Okay. Also, the same type of problem would occur for social security taxes. For example, you have an executive that's making a lot of money in the first quarter. Okay. So one, two, three, four. So this executive, by the first, by, by the end of the first quarter, they might have made one hundred and forty thousand dollars. The reason I selected one forty because I know it's more than the social security tax now. So at this time, at this time, they paid all their social security tax. But guess what? This social security tax is for the whole year. Okay, but they paid it during the first quarter. So what do you do? Do you expense it there or do you sp spread it? Same thing for research and development. Like same concept with, ad with advertising. H how do you know how many periods it's going to benefit and how should you allocate it? The same concept would apply to major repairs because it applies to more than one period. Okay, for example, should the company expense social security on a highly paid personnel early in the year or allocate and spread them to subsequent period? Okay, again, here the company will have to decide should a major repair that occurred later in the year be anticipated and allocated proportionally should you do that or should you connect it to one period okay other expenses that are subject to year-end adjustments for example bad debt how should you book the bad debt should you wait till the end of the year or you should you book it on a quarterly basis well you can do it on a quarterly basis then adjust it executive bonuses you really don't know pension costs those are all estimate so what should you do? You should estimate these costs and allocate them the best you can because those are just estimates in the first place. Okay? And you could use a variety of allocation technique. So how you, you do it, it's up to you. Okay? Uh, income tax. And for income tax, we'll work an example because it's interesting. It, it basically it involves two type of, uh, two type of uh, discipline, financial accounting and taxes. So we'll look at an example. Uh, the, the profession uses the annualized approach. Now, what is the annualized approach? Well, it means at the end of the period, at the end of the interim period, the company should make the best estimate of the effective tax rate. So you have to compute the effective tax rate expected to be applicable. So what's my effective tax rate? And the effective is, you know, how much actually am I, am I, am I, am I, am I going to end up paying? And you're going to have to estimate this number. Okay. So the rate, the rate so determined should be used in providing for income taxes on the for the quarter so this is what you would do for the quarter so you'd have to estimate now how would you estimate the best way to illustrate this is to actually work an example so let's take a look at this company just kind of show you how this whole picture fits together and we're going to be giving actual earning for the first two quarter and the estimated during the year so the company basically um they can estimate they can estimate their earning this is their actual first quarter earning so this is during the first quarter and that's their actual they made four hundred thousand dollar their actual second quarter is five hundred and ten okay this is their earnings first quarter estimate of annual earning one million three hundred and fifty so they think for the whole year based on their first on their first estimate based on the first quarter they estimate the revenue to be one million three hundred and fifty by the time to get to the second quarter they find out that yeah they're doing better Therefore, their estimated earning by the second quarter, it should be one, 1, 420. Now, why did they increase this? Well, their salespeople told them, you know, you know, we are selling more than what we expected. Therefore, we're going to up our estimate, up our earning estimate. Okay. So also the company, 
estimated its permanent differences between accounting income and taxable income. So this is now we're getting into taxation. Um, environmental violation penalties, $25,000. And dividend income exclusion, 180000 Now, if you don't know what these are, like what is he talking about? Why are we including this? Or when I can perform the computation, you have to go to my income tax course. Okay, go to my channel, go to my website, go to my channel, and um, you can find, you know, you could learn about income tax course. So simply put, how are we going to estimate the first quarter taxes? So let's do it quarter by quarter. Here's what we do. First, we'd say this is our first quarter estimate of annual earning. So let's start with this number. This is what we estimate to earn. Now we, we are computing our taxes. Now bear in mind, we have to add back the 25,000 because the 25,000 is not deductible because it's a violation penalties. Violation penalties are not be, are not deductible. Then we have to deduct the dividend income exclusion because they do give us a deduction for that. And if you don't know what this is, this is called the dividend received deduction, DRD. Again, you have to know taxes here. That's going to give us our estimated annual uh, estimated taxable income. And this is going to be 1,100,000 and 95,000. This is our estimate of taxable income. This is how much we estimate. This is how much we estimate. Now, based on this estimate, we can compute our income tax based on the rate. And the rate is 42%. Here we go. So I'm just gonna, just the rate is given. You have to know what your rate is. Your rate is 42%. That's your rate. So if you take 1,995,000 multiplied by 42%, 501,900. So this is your this is your estimate annual income taxes payable. This is the estimate. This is how much you think you are going to pay based on your your estimate your estimate income your estimate income of 1,320,000. Okay, this is all estimate. Now we need to compute the effective. Well, what is the effective? Okay, so the effective is I'm gonna have to pay 501. If you're saying I'm gonna have to pay 501,900 based on your best estimate, based on a 1,350,000 of earnings. Okay, 1,350,000 in earning. Then my effective rate is 37.2. Well, if this is my effective, if this is my effective, and I made 400,000 for the first quarter times 37.2%, therefore my taxes should be 148,800. Debit income tax expense, credit income taxes payable. So first, I needed to find out what's my effective. So I look, I looked at my estimate, my annual estimate. And I figure out what's my estimated taxable income. Then I multiplied by 42%. This is my estimate taxes. So I took my estimate taxes divided by estimated revenue. My effective should be 37. Well, if it's 37 and I made 400,000, then I have to book 148,800. And this is the computation in detail plus the journal entry in case you know you missed something from my computation. Okay. Now, we're going to do the same thing for the second quarter. We're going to do the same thing for the second quarter. So, the second quarter, our estimate annual earning is 1420000 Basically, we increased our estimate. I guess we're doing good. Then we um, subtract 180 add the uh, subtract 180 add the 25 so we need to subtract subtract 180 and add 25 we need to subtract 155 remember the 180 is for the dividend received deduction and the 25 is for the penalty because we cannot deduct the penalty we have to add it back but we can deduct the dividend received deduction therefore the net is one 155 so this is the net the net is 155 okay so 155 so your estimated taxable income is 1,265,000 well, if I take if I take this number one million two hundred and sixty five times forty two percent, 
I will have an estimated taxes now, 531 notice. My estimated taxes were, were 501,900 earlier. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be making more money. I estimate to pay more taxes. I will do the same thing. I will take my, what should be my estimate taxes, divided my estimate earnings, and my rate now is 37.4. It makes sense. It's higher. The more money you make, the more taxes you pay. 37.4%. Now, I'm doing this, um, but bear in mind that now the uh, it's a little bit easier because there's a flat tax rate now of 21%, okay? Uh, so just this is for illustration purposes, but basically the tax rate do change and now there's a flat rate. So it's, it's a little bit easier because the rate, in a sense, the same, okay? Now, your cumulative income tax. Now, what's your cumulative income tax? Well, cumulative, I'm sorry, not cumulative income to date, you made 400,000 first quarter, 510 the second quarter you made so far 910,000 now you're going to multiply this by 37.4 because this is your estimated effective so your taxes should be up to the second quarter 340,340 340,340,340 dollars this is your cumulative cumulative means this is your quarter this is your first quarter taxes plus you set your second quarter taxes based on the estimate so guess what you already recorded 148800 therefore what left for the second quarter to book 191540 and this is maybe this picture will illustrate the concept for you so you'll debit income tax expense credit income taxes payable for 191500 and this is what happened those are your four quarter fourth four quarters in the first quarter we booked 148800 and by the second quarter we find out we should be at 340 we should be at 340 340,340 dollars therefore our second quarter taxes were 191,540 basically it's the if we need to end up with 340, 340 we already booked 148 well 195 is what's needed for the second quarter and we'll do the same thing for the third quarter by the third quarter we might have increased the estimate annual earning or reduced it we'll follow the same steps changes in interim period if you have a change in estimate accounted for as an interim period when the change is made you changes your depreciation you changes any type of estimate you did uh, depreciation is a form of estimate bad debt expense warranty no restatement of prior period prior interim period and the effect of earning disclose on the current and subsequent period and you have to disclose that you have a change in estimate obviously and the effect of the on the current and subsequent period now would you would you have to go back and change the change any numbers if it's practical and easy you might be able to but otherwise change in estimate is treated prospectively now if you don't know how to deal with change in estimate change in accounting principle go to my intermediate accounting chapter 22 because this is what this topic specifically entails minimum disclosure and interim report what do you need to disclose basically now this is a list of laundry uh, gross revenue provisions for income taxes there is no more extraordinary item um, basic and diluted earnings per share you have to show the basic and the diluted seasonal revenue cost or expense just explain the seasonal revenue how is it seasonal significant changes in estimate we just talked about this or provision for income taxes if there's any changes in the provision of income taxes and we looked at it and there were some changes in the income tax effective rate disposal of a segment of a business um, there's no more extraordinary uh, contingent items any contingent item changes in accounting principle or estimate again changes in estimate significant change in financial position and any other relevant information that you think it's relevant for the users if you have any questions about this topic please email me if you happen to visit my website for additional lectures please consider donating if you happen to visit my C um, if you are studying for the cpa exam as always study hard it's worth it and see you on the other side of success